Today my top tips is going to focus around the pain and movement reasoning model by Jones and O'Shaughnessy. This model is not specific to patellofemoral pain but I think it's really useful and I wanted to flag this up and hopefully it will help you think uh, more critically about how you're assessing and treating your patients. So as you can see it's based around this triangle. At the top we have CNS modulation so that can be anything from their past experience, their general health, and particularly, as I found with my recent research on crepitus, the top cognitive emotive uh, elements such as their negative beliefs about their crepitus, their fear avoidance, their social context. So, for example, are they a carpenter and they're struggling to work? Are they a teenager on a sports scholarship and the patellofemoral pain is perceived as a threat to that? And then coming down to the right-hand side at the bottom of the triangle, we have local stimulation. So that would be the person that has had a heavy blow to the front of the knee, fallen heavily onto their patella. It can also be in patellofemoral pain where there's prolonged um, patellofemoral malalignments. You can get compression and stretch of the parapatella soft tissues. And then particularly in the patella fat pad, we often see inflammation which will create a chemical stimulation. So that is local stimulation, local to the patellofemoral joint. And then the bottom left, we can see regional influences. So very often we might be considering aspects of the foot. We might be looking at aspects around the femoral neck control, around pelvic position. We may look at people with hypermobility. We may look at um, the fact that they've got altered proprioception following a previous ankle inversion injury. We may find that they've got a legacy of poor gluteus maximus following an episode of low back pain. So it helps us to think what are the relative influences into this person's pain and how they move. And also as they change over time, which influences are changing either for the better or for the worse. We should help us reason through our tact and therefore we should end up with two potentially patients with the same diagnostic label of patellofemoral pain, but somebody might have their relatively contributing factors right up in the top part of this triangle. We really may want to spend a lot of time looking at re-education around the perceived threat from their pain, whereas somebody that has an acutely inflamed infrapatella fat pad might actually be right down in the bottom right-hand side and need much more local treatment. And the reality of it is that the majority of the patients will actually have influences of all three elements. And so, although this model is not specific to patellofemoral pain, I find it very useful. I do sometimes explain it with patients so that they understand why their problem has come about. Particularly in cases that are in deciduous onset, the health beliefs literature shows that it's much harder for patients to engage with their problem and engage, therefore, with their treatment. Something like this can just help really explain the situation. If you've enjoyed that and would like more things that may influence your practice around patellofemoral pain, have a look at my website, clairepatella.com, where you can also register for my clinical commentary, and there are also webinars on there. Look out for more top tips soon.